thanks very much. Does that work? Yeah. Thanks very much, Norm, for the invitation to uh, come over here and talk about this and the invitation to be part of this group to um, look at this somewhat different topic area to um, the more quantitative talks that we've had in the last couple of days. So um, basically, um, going to talk about a topic that's had quite a lot of work in the last 20 years in the uh, research domain, uh, funded um, by groups such as SCAG and um, New Zealand government and NEHERP and that sort of thing. So thanks to um, Norm and Steve and Nora and Tom and a uh, colleague in New Zealand for some of the, um, the um, assistance to do with this bit of work. So um, it's a topic area, as I say, it's had a um, reasonable amount of focus in the research domain, um, not so much in the, in the practical applications in terms of actually constraining real seismic hazard models. Um, but it's had to have had the, this research time to sort out some of the issues and the uncertainties. And so what I'm showing here are examples of fragile geologic features. Um, the main class of fragile geologic feature that has been the uh, topic of a, lot of, the, of a lot of the research are these precariously balanced rocks. And this is a fairly extreme example from North Queensland where not many earthquakes and um, examples of reasonably precarious features from California. This is, this is a, an example in granitic rocks on the <coughs> hanging wall of the White Wolf Fault in um, Southern California. This is an example from New Zealand in Schist Terrain um, near a dam site that I've been leading a seismic hazard assessment on for a number of years. And we are now at the stage of using these features to see what they can tell us about hazard in the area. And um, this is a um, sea stack feature that was basically right over the um, epicenter of the uh, Christchurch earthquake in February 2011. And um, rock motions of over a G resulted in the feature being somewhat shattered. So fragile landforms, they sit around for a very long period of time, get shaken down by strong earthquake shaking. And so if you know the approximate fragility of these features and how long they've been sitting like that, they might be able to tell you something about non-exceedance of motions or what motions they could handle without being shaken down. And then I say, I use the generic term fragile geologic feature because it's not just precarious rocks. You actually have features like this, unstable cliff faces where you have open joints and if you shook a cliff face like this you would get a lot of damage. So if you can work out how old the surfaces of the cliff face are and what it would take to bring them down, you can provide some constraints on hazard. And this is an example that I've worked on um, some years back in Yucca Mountain. And I have to acknowledge Jim Brune. He's the man who first came up with the idea of these fragile geologic features being able to tell us something about seismic hazard, but independent of data sets that are used in seismic hazard models. So I've more or less said this, uh, the first thing here in my outline, but I've been given these three questions here to address in this talk um, by Corolla and Norm. Um, Diablo Canyon power plant, what features, what fragile <coughs> geologic features are uh, present in the area that, that could be used for constraining or at least comparing to hazard estimates? And how fragile are they and, and some initial estimates of fragility? <coughs> and I have to say that I've really just started on this work at the power plant and so the, um, the efforts in this area are very preliminary 
back of the envelope right now. And, but I have um, looked at what can be done more substantially there. So um, a little um, timeline here. Uh, went into the field with Steve Thompson and Nora um, Lewowski. Is that correct? Oh, Lewinowski. Lewinowski, thank you. And Tom Hanks uh, to have a look at features that had originally been observed in 2010 um, by, by Steve and, and others to give basically a um, second-hand um, opinion on whether these features were worthwhile for follow-up work, um, considering the work that I'd been doing and applying them in New Zealand and elsewhere. And so, in, a, in short, I uh, only really saw one of these features as being suitable for follow-up work, but found three additional ones that hadn't really been identified before in the same area. So four features at least looking worthwhile to study. And all of them at the Double Rock East site, so I'll show you where that is. So um, the power plant's the star here, and the three sites that we looked at, Double Rock East to the southeast of the, the plant, um, the intake in the area of the intake, there's a, there's a um, intake bay, there's an, a fragile arch, and then there was the crowbar site. So this is the Double Rock site. What we're looking at here are sea stacks that are fossilised. They're basically uplifted sea stacks that used to be eroded and shaped by the sea, but with long-term earthquake uplifts, etc., they're now um, quite a bit above sea level and not being attacked by the sea anymore. So for, for um, assessing the age of these features, it means that there's no um, interference with being in the modern sea environment. That's very difficult for dating. And so these features are very in very resistant rock types, Franciscan cherts, and the bedding is pretty much vertical, which gives them these very um, solid, slabby appearance. They're not fragile in themselves. They're very strong features, but it's more the features that sit on the side of them where the bedding planes are peeling apart just with, with the aging process and exposure. And this is, this is the Double Rock East site, and that's on Double Rock East, and this is Double Rock West. And um, this is the feature in profile. So a piece of chert that's slabbing the bedding plane is opening up, and um, the feature is sitting there unstably. This is the one feature. Um, identified in 2010, but then on Double Rock West, as we walked along here, here we are for scale. Um, three more features. They might be a little bit unclear in this in this scale and colour, but similar sorts of things to this sort of slabbing feature. So this feature sits unstably on a sloping pedestal. So, and I might also add that the surface here is between, the surfaces are between 80 and 120,000 years. So these are features with some considerable antiquity to them, and by inference, these features um, would hopefully be in the sort of ages of being thousands to low tens of thousands of years. That's completely unknown at present. So this is a close-up of Double Rock East, and the scale's rather hidden in here, but um, my height would probably be up to about here. So, and so using um, the, the initial easy field-based, um, very rough assessment of quasi-static toppling accelerations from the geometry of the rock and the center of mass and the rocking points, if you assume this is a feature that if you shock it, it would fail by toppling acceleration, um, by toppling, basically coming out like this on its um, pedestals. So this is something that Jim Brune uses in the field. You'd roughly guesstimate the centre of mass 
the vertical and the rocking points. And really for a rock like this, sitting so close to the country rock, it can only really fall in one direction. And so this angle alpha here is the relevant angle for its um, stability. And so using Jim's very simplistic estimate of quasi-static toppling acceleration, tan alpha, about half a g. So in Jim's old scheme of things, that would be not precarious, but semi-precarious. So shaken down by reasonably strong shaking, not low levels of shaking like, for example, the, um, the Australian feature I showed. And if you instead assume that this would fail by sliding, you get a very similar answer with a very rough Newmark type analysis using slope angle and um, angle of internal friction, etc. So this is a very ballpark type rough estimate. As I say, this is a very low resolution, um, less quantitative um, sort of a topic than, than what's been talked about the last couple of days. So in the reconnaissance, I was also, we also looked at the, revisited the crowbar site and the intake bay arch, delicate arch site. Now the, the um, sea stacks at crowbar, they're more subdued. They're not those very, very steep, hard Franciscan sea stack outcrops. And that's because the, the materials are tertiary welded tufts, they're, 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 they're hard rocks, but not as hard as Franciscan materials, so they erode away and produce produce um, talus slopes. And this was the, the feature called crowbar, a big boulder sitting on top of this hill. In actual fact, we, we all thought it wasn't particularly fragile, take reasonable shaking to bring it down, is the impression that we got. And similarly, other features uh, on the neighboring sea stack. And the delicate arch, while quite a fragile feature, um, where it is located uh, at the, um, in the intake bay makes it access quite difficult. And for dating purposes, it's problematic because it's still at the um, waterfront. So looking very um, simply here at um, the hazard curves for um, Diablo Canyon, I'm, I've looked at a uh, the shoreline report hazard curves and um, tried to get um, some idea of the sorts of um, ages, if we knew the ages of these rocks, what sort of age would be useful for the purposes of the hazard. And um, I draw on work um, done by Anderson and Brune and Norm, where you basically use a points and hazard space approach, which is a reasonably simple, intuitive process of of um, plotting one over the age of the, the rocks and their toppling accelerations on hazard curves. And so we can't do that at the moment because we don't really have the, we don't have the ages of these features. But if we looked at some ballpark um, fragility values, so toppling accelerations, say if the, the 0.5G back of the envelope uh, toppling acceleration um, if we looked at where that would plot on this, basically the uh, return time of that is about a thousand years. But if it was um, less fragile, say 1G, the, um, the um, equivalent return time is about 20,000 years. Now that varies depending on the hazard curves you look at. But in, in essence, what these rocks really, <coughs> what we really have to find is that if, they're, if, if they plot anywhere inside this area of the hazard curve, then there's a discrepancy with the hazard in that the hazard curve is, is producing ground motions that are occurring um, stronger than the, rock can, with, the rocks can withstand too often. And so there's, there's a violation there. They really have to plot somewhere outside of this curve here to be compatible with the hazard curve. 
So, um, as I say, we, we don't know whereabouts to plot these values at the moment, but assuming 0.5 g would be their toppling accelerations, then they're only going to be useful if their age is a thousand years or more. And if we looked at the an alternative an alternative hazard curve here, this is just, just going online on, on the national maps, hazard curve, which I did before I got the, the shoreline report, uh, half a G, rock motions, recurrence, return time of one to 2,000 years, and one G, 10 to 20,000 years-ish. So, basically we need to know uh, more about the fragility and the age of these features, but at least as far as the purposes of this, um, this workshop, we've been able to identify these, at least identify features that, that look suitable for studies. So, um, moving forward, what uh, really needs to happen, um, I've, I've worked, talked about this with people and, ba and basically uh, there's a fa fairly simplistic type of um, analysis or series of analysis that we can do, 2D analyses of the stability of these features. Focusing on Double Rock East, that's the initially identified feature and it actually already has been sampled for cosmogenic dating by Dylan Road some years earlier. He's got the samples sitting there and uh, he would say his one recommendation is to, to do some dating on those features all ready to go and he's had experience with doing this at Yucca Mountain on similar features. So what, what I'd like to recommend is simple 2D analysis of the Double Rock East feature and basically by a variety of methods to work out what it takes to achieve a factor of safety of less than one where the, another, um, from earthquake shaking and um, in other words failure of the features and that can define the limiting ground motions. And so with a colleague Fernando in GNS we have this rock slide software and we can look at three failure modes, block sliding, um, as it is it, in its present geometry, block sliding after disintegration of base due to weathering, etc., or a um, toppling failure, you know, using the more classical Brune type of um, analysis. But basically, you can do the three of these in the software. And um, as I say, revisit Dylan's samples that he has over in Glasgow and get the fragility age for Double Rock. He does a series of samples and he models them and the output of it is in the age that the rock has been in its present fragile state by sampling on the rock and sampling the country rock in behind. And then compare those initial results to the PSH model and see what, see what comes out of that. And then if we wanted to do this really properly, it would involve 3D modelling of the, all four of these rocks because really, I have to say, there's an emphasis probably in the, in the, science, in the science domain and due to funding restrictions, etc., there's probably been too much of an emphasis on the, the rarities, the occasional pe precariously balanced rocks that you see around the place and, and maybe going too far with over-interpreting them in, the, um, in terms of comparing to, to seismic hazard maps, cyber shake, etc, etc. Um, the, the, the key thing that I'm pushing in this is that there, there is a more substantial defensible result to be had by looking at more than just one feature and that's why I say the first stage, looking at Double Rock East, is just an indication, but I was very pleased to see more than one feature there. I mean, this is, we're still only talking four features, and it's still, it, it, there's still a, bit, a lot of uncertainty there. Um, but at least getting through this process, there'd be quite a, a substantial um, answer. So looking at all the four of the fragile features, um, 
possibly we could make inferences about on, a, on their age, on their ages with uncertainties after having done the analysis on Double Rock East. Um, but use Hosgrey Fault or any sorts of um, relevant time histories with these 3D models to obtain fragilities according to, to um, you know, real earthquakes. And um, yeah, this is, as I say, could potentially be an, an optional item. And then um, compare more substantially to the, to the PSH model. So, as I say, I'm, it's really preliminary at this stage and I've only just started on it, but so the um, conclusions are, are quite preliminary and, and forward-looking. So we've identified four features at the Double Rock site and the Crowbar site not really being suitable um, for follow-up studies and um, recommended 2D fragility analysis followed by 3D fragility analysis. So I think that's... that's so the, the key is if that date comes out over a thousand years, then there's, there's a, a chance we could get a constraint on the hazard. If it yeah. comes out hundreds of years, then it's... Then it's, then it's not, right. yeah. Because I think it's at least 0.5 G is okay. the fragility. Probably not 1 G is my sense. Just, um, and um, age-wise, um, I would say, based on Yucca Mountain work, um, I wouldn't be surprised if it was in the 10 to 20,000 years of age. Um, it's, it's a wetter environment, so it may be younger than that, but similar features at Yucca Mountain, you know, I was in the 20, 20 to 50,000 years age. And that's in a pretty, tech, well, the, one of the areas I looked at was a pretty active, tectonically active environment. So any questions for Mark? You need to use the microphone. Your software that you mentioned, is it finite element software? The Pardon? software that you mentioned, yeah. is it a finite element software package? You mentioned a software? Yes, yes. I just didn't get Is it a finite element yeah. software? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hans? Uh, when you're comparing these fragile features um, and their age and presumably failure accelerations to the hazard curve, are you using the mean curves or a fractal? No, that, those were, those were just straight um, hazard curves. Those were means. Those were means. They were means. Right. Okay. Um, the national maps, it was, um, I think, the, the full sigma was no. in there. Yeah, but it's a mean hazard. Yeah. You can use oh, it. Yeah, yeah, he's asking if right. it's mean or if yeah. are the fractals there. If it, yeah. the days are long enough, you can use them to try to eliminate or rule out some of your fractals. I have a question. Hi. Hi. Um, does this take into account the direction of shaking? Because it looked like for some of those, uh, you know, whether you know the component is north, south, or east, west, does it take all of that into account as well? Um, yeah, those features really will will only um, it'll only be relevant in terms of shaking that that is um, normal to the um, Hosgrey fault. Correct. I mean, it's only going to shake only going to topple in one direction. So it will only be relevant to shaking that's more or less normal to the Osgrey Fault. Okay. No, yeah. So I was wondering, so yeah. I mean, for instance, you're getting some path effect from a different direction. It yeah, might they, necessarily topple it, but... Yeah, well, the, if you did the 3D analysis, you'd have the 3D geometry of the, the rock, and then you could throw... Um, you could you could throw time histories at it from any direction. It would be less fragile in that, you know, in, that in shaking that's that's parallel to the bedding. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so so you could actually still probably use them, but for higher levels of, of fragility. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. The so ideal thing is to have one of those beautiful 
features like the Queens, North Queensland right, so one where they're away. fragile in all directions. Right, okay. Yeah. So it might be like one particular ground motion in one direction, but something in a different one. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's right. And the thing is to find features on various orientations, but yeah, we're dealing, we're dealing with, with bedded chert where all the, all the um, landforms are lined up in one direction, so it's, it's a bit limiting. It's not like some of those, those sites out in, in um, the Mojave Desert. Yeah, but, but you know, it, okay. it's, it's Mark, what we've got. Yeah. One last question, Bob, you had yeah, one um, last question. I've heard Jim Brune give talks about this a dozen times or even 25, <laughs> and he yeah. always starts with the same warning, which I know you know, but I want to make sure everybody else understands. Imagine you have three features out there that you saw, but I want you to imagine that uh, 10,000 years ago there were 300 of them, and only three survived. So 297 of them toppled, which really means these represent the 1% point on a fertility curve, the, one, the few survivors. If that's true, then your estimate of the, of, of the motion it takes to topple them in, in, in whatever space you need could be off by very large factors, like two anyway, or maybe even more. And you have to know something about this question before you can proceed very far yeah. Uh, within factors of two, and factors of two are that's two in whatever you call the size of the motion. That's but, a big factor. But there would be, of course, if there was hundreds of them. They we should see their bodies laying on the ground. <laughs> well, you don't know. You, you, maybe, maybe this, not. This is this is um, a question that I've raised um, in in SCEC research and and had well, you know, minor SCEC funding, but still kept SCEC funding to look at. And we've been, and Dylan Rood and I have been undertaking a, um, a review of all the well-studied precarious rock sites, and we actually see a much larger. Well, you see the rare precarious features, but you see them in terrain where you would expect, if they were t really telling you something about the ground motion, the the suitable geology there. And the, you know, is such that you should still you should see hundreds, no, if not I, thousands, of them. I mean, I agree. I was so, exaggerating to think it was so, one in a hundred, but I, but still, yeah. uh, once you've thought about it that way, you do have to try to think about the, yeah. the ensemble of which there's a denominator, which this is the numerator. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's a there's a site, Lovejoy Buttes. It's 15 kilometres from the San Andreas Fault. There's two precarious rocks that are a really big thing have been made of. But there are, there are hundreds of semi-precarious ones which give you fragilities of about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 G. And to me, that's, that's probably quite consistent with San Andreas earthquakes. And it's had you know, many tens of San Andreas earthquakes pass there. So it's, uh, it's something I'm pushing at the moment. I argue a lot with Jim about this statistical remnants thing. Diablo, we've only, I mean, I, I still have to have more of a look around, around, around there, but I, to see if we, we can possibly identify more than just four, to see whether we've got a real, really strong, a stronger signal there. But yeah, on the same page. All right, we need to wrap up, so thanks, Mark. So